Wednesday? Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Wednesday. Here we go. All right, everyone, let's welcome Hannah Hart. Hello. Hello. And I don't know if she needs an intro, but I'm going to give her an intro anyway. And don't forget to introduce <laughs> yourself, too. Oh, I'm Stephanie Lumpkin. I work on YouTube, um, and I am very honored to be uh, moderating this chat today. I'm very honored that we chose pumpkin colors without texting at all, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, Hannah has uh, been creating uh, YouTube videos in a series called My Drunk Kitchen um, for a while now. Um, <laughs> but she's also co-produced and stars multiple films and hosted her own show on the Food Network called I Heart Food. Um, in 2018, she uh, launched Hannah Lies This, a uh, self-help uh, podcast. That just can't help itself. <laughs> <laughs> and she currently produces and hosts uh, Tasty's Edible History on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> no resentment there. No resentment there. Um, but anyway, um, Hannah is uh, very authentic, and in her content, she has established herself as one of the most influential voices in the LGBTQ community. And she's gained her recognition um, as one of the Hollywood Reporter's new digital uh, disruptors and uh, one of Forbes 30 under 30. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What a blur. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you were born and raised in Northern California, and you currently reside in uh, LA with your fiance and your two cats. Thank you. So I do. It's true. You can follow. Uh, actually, you can follow my cats on Charles underscore and underscore Lady on Instagram. They're great cats. We try and do their Instagram, but we don't care that much. We like to text people cute pictures of them. <laughs> But most importantly, Hannah is here to talk about her book, My Drunk Kitchen Holidays. Um, and she's a two times New York Times best selling author. And uh. Probably three times, should I say? Knock on wood, but you know what? <laughs> let's not let's not let's not even worry about it. Nobody asks New York Times bestselling author how many times versus <laughs> how many books did you publish? So hey, if it's three times, amazing. If it's not, that's okay. <laughs> Hannah told herself. <laughs> Perfect. So um, I got the pleasure to, to get the book before this, this chat and read through it. And I, I feel like I identify with you a lot. Um, I mean, I think part, part of your personality and, and who you are is to, to make people feel like you connect with them. And you did a great job with me. Oh. So thank you. Oh, thank you for reading the book. That's so <laughs> sweet. You guys should do that too. HannahHart.com slash book or they're for sale in the corner over there. Yeah. Um, so. One thing that really called my attention uh, when. Sorry. Yeah, the book's not even out yet. So you guys can get a book <laughs> today. You'd be insane not to. Oh my God. It just occurred to me it's not October 22nd. Yeah. So, Next week. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to put a little latch on them. <laughs> Sorry, continue. No, no problem. Um, so, one thing that really called my attention is, is, is the concept of the book. Um, that you create your own traditions. That really resonated with me. Um, so before we start talking about the book, tell me a little bit about how you've gotten to this point in your life. And have you always been trying to, to get to this point where you're writing books? Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, I think um, that's a great question. For me, writing books in particular has always been near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm a book lover. I love them as pieces of art. I love them as written works. There's a lot of ways you can enjoy books now, audio. You can do the ebook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when I got my start online back in 2011, um, and we can skip that whole kibosh. It goes a little, it goes a little something like this. Back in March 2011, back when YouTube wasn't really what it is today, I got my start by making a video as a joke for a friend of mine. And then when 100,000 strangers saw it, I thought, whoa, is this an open door into media? <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Eight years of pioneering later, the idea of the YouTube star exists, and I'm now on my third book. So that's the long and short of it. Thank you. <laughs> I just, you know, it's funny because it's one of those things I'm going to be saying all day, every day for the next two weeks. And so I figure in the house of Google, in the house of YouTube, maybe this is the one space where I don't have to explain how YouTube got its start. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to lean into that. Um, but anyway, my, my biggest ambition back in that time was to maybe one day publish a book. Yep. Um, at the time, no other YouTubers had published books yet. There was John Green, who was an author who then became a uh, online content creator. But at the time, going from YouTube to books, 
didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So people looked at me like, you're crazy, you're out of your mind. Why would you want to publish something that's part of a dying industry when here you are thriving in the new budding industries of entertainment? And I said, screw you, I really want to publish a book. <laughs> so My Drunk Kitchen, the first one, A Guide to Eating, Drinking, and Going with Your Gut, was really about surviving. It was a testament to my 20s. It was about taking the child you and helping them come into your adult self while forgiving them for the mistakes that they make along the way. <laughs> so My Drunk Kitchen Holidays is now, what, seven, six, seven years after that book. Um, and it's very much a testament to my 30s, which is about building the foundation and the family that's going to be behind me. You know, in your 20s, you're processing and letting go of all the things that you brought with you to that point. You're deciding, OK, these are the parts of me I'm going to keep. These are the parts of me I'm not going to keep. When you get to your 30s, you get to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. So if your 20s are surviving, your 30s are thriving. And that's something that I think, especially in today's climate, I really wanted to put my words out there and put these thoughts out there because there's so much to savor and celebrate even though there's so much that um, is bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so that's really why I felt strongly about wanting to do a holiday book. And also, frankly, I wanted to challenge myself. Yeah. I mean, my dad was a Jehovah's Witness and we didn't really grow up celebrating holidays or birthdays. Okay. Um, so I've always just kind of like seen holidays as like a cute, fun thing other people get to do. And so then I decided to publish this book to force my way into it. I was like, I want to be welcome here. I want to be my queer, happy self during the holidays. These are what my holidays look like. Yeah. And that's really what this book is all about. So, so tell us a little bit about, about those holidays. Something that resonated to me was uh, creating traditions. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, you know, her holidays are, you know, the typical holidays, but then there's, there's holidays that are really special to you, like uh, Vision Board Day, which was pretty impressive to me <laughs> <There's> <laughs> you know, to celebrate a day that where you you know vision board mm -hmm. um, so yeah tell us a little bit about how you selected those those days well first I googled the month I was like March <laughs> so the way the book looks and I um, actually and you grabbing one yeah thank you um, the way the book is laid out is that it's 12 months of the year so Linnea Tony everybody yeah the man the myth the legend <laughs> that's my manager She's my everything. <laughs> OK, <clears throat> so the way the book is laid out is that it goes through all 12 months of the year and is separated by these little colored pages, which introduce you to the next month. See? Okay. Um, so one of the things that I really wanted to do was kind of create, effectively, a guidebook about how to survive the year leading up to what would become the holiday experience. Um, so as I was doing that, I just kind of went and pulled out first if you really, this is nitty gritty. Here's the nitty gritty answer. Yeah. I made my outline of what I wanted the message to be. And then I went month by month and found the holidays that kind of fit accordingly. So um, uh, the philosophy the book begins with is that New Year's isn't about resolutions. It's not about cutting things out of your life you don't want. It's not about changing yourself for who you are. It's about reflecting on your favorite moments from last year and making sure you have more of those moments this year. Okay. So I encourage people to look at the last year and be like, what was one of the things I loved? Oh, I went to an outdoor concert. That was great. My New Year's resolution, go to two this year. Go to two outdoor concerts. So it starts the year with a lot less weight. Uh, so to answer your question, which I forgot, there's a lot of weird holidays in there. Left-handers day, middle child's day, I am in control day, which is my favorite of the days, <laughs> <laughs> and whatnot. You know, it really is meant to be read start to finish, but it can also be flipped through as like a coffee table book. Um, but if you read it start to finish, you'll see that by the end, it should leave you feeling like you're ready to start the year again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Those are all my thoughts and feelings. That's awesome. And there's also some real recipes in there. So it's October, and there is a very interesting story about your fiance. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you did read the book. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to tell us about why you love October so much and, and a little bit of the insights of, of your relationship with your partner? Yeah, absolutely. Ella, who's my fiance, uh, she appears often in the book, not constantly, but as often enough your life partner would, right? Um, and so, like, we talk, so in, in the Valentine's Day recipes, we make see, sweet and savory cupcakes because relationships are about balance. So this is kind of a nod to that. But there's also a recipe in October uh, for garlic pasta, like this pasta dish. Uh, and I talk a little bit about it in my most recent video, um, garlic, vampire garlic fries. Long story short, 
<laughs> <laughs> I kid you not, but for the first three months of our relationship, Ella Milnichenko, toyed, not toyed, was battling the idea and belief that I, Hannah Hart, was in fact a vampire. <laughs> Just a real ass vampire lady. <laughs> and about three months in on a date night, she asks me whether or not I'm a vampire. So I write all about it in the book. If you want to read the story, read the book. <laughs> the end. That's all I'm going to say. Get the book to find out how that story ends. All I can say is that I love Ella very, very much. And frankly, I was quite like kind of touched. I was like, OK, I am a vampire. Cool. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Something that I thought was, was really interesting is you know, through, through your tra trajectory of your life, you've learned a lot of things. Um, and something that really called my attention is the relationship between telling stories on YouTube and telling stories in, in written, which was your dream. Um, can you talk a little bit about how all those years on YouTube, writing stories, not stories, but writing scripts or um, planning. Telling stories. Yeah, telling stories, how that helped you um, with where you are today? Well, it helped me have someone you know, buy a book from me, which was great. After that first book came out and they saw that YouTubers could publish bestsellers, uh, then I got another book, which was awesome. And then I slid in buffering on show Tales of a Life Fully Loaded uh, because it was a memoir about mental health, homelessness, and uh, coming out. And it's just a very different book. But I basically had to prove myself with the first My Drunk Kitchen, and then afterwards, I really jumped in, jumped in there and was like, great, and now here's a memoir. Um, <laughs> so I think YouTube has helped me, though, and I think that this is really what your question is saying. It's helped me as a storyteller and a performer and, frankly, as someone who really appreciates the team. When you're a one-woman production company, as so many of the beginning years of my time online were, you really learn how to direct, you learn how to edit, you learn how to complete a thought from start to finish, you learn how to create the story three times, once in the conception, once in the production, and then after in the editing and crafting of it. Um, and I think that really strengthened me as a storyteller. And it made me, when I got to work on bigger productions like I Heart Food or any of the films that we've done, uh, it just made me so grateful because there were so many people there. And all I had to do was just be a Hannah, and that was awesome. You know, Because <laughs> when, when you're editing your own stuff, you're like, damn it, Hannah. <laughs> you know, and trying to like get it all together. Um, so it just seemed like the most blessed job to be like, I'm just supposed to be in the moment and connect with people. You guys are doing the lights? OK. <laughs> you know, so I think that in a lot of ways, that learning curve helped me, I guess, be more grateful. Do you think that it was easier to write a book after you have that practice of, of doing, you know, writing and thinking and? No. I think that my degree in English literature made it easier to write a book. <laughs> uh, I studied English lit and Japanese language. I mean, I've been writing my whole life. It's always been that part of me that's like my private expressive place. And after Buffering came out, I actually intentionally, not intentionally, but I, I couldn't write. You know, I didn't want to journal. I didn't want to write. I couldn't go to that space um, because I had just, ugh. You know, and I didn't want to be like, somebody was like, oh, you're going to write another memoir? And I'm like, am I going to do another 30 years of life in the next month? No. <laughs> what? Talk to me in 15. Like, um, so I really took a break. And when I was ready to write again, this is the book that I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. um, and so it might seem a little all over the place for people to be like, why would you do a comedy cookbook, then a memoir, then another comedy cookbook? But it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your creative process. You said how, how you decided on the months and how you went through the, the decision of like leading up to, to, to the holidays after June, um, the holiday experience. Um, tell us a little bit about why a cookbook. Um, how did you think of, of the, the general message that you want to? Yeah, um, I always like to say that in the house party of life, I would be hanging out in the kitchen. Okay. You know, uh, you, you've got your people that are on the dance floor. You've got your people that are smoking outside, talking about politics, smoking weed, not cigarettes. Cigarettes are bad for you. Uh, yeah. And then you've got you know, people in the kitchen. And it's a little quieter. It's still active. You can hear the party, but it's just outside. You can have a more intimate conversation. And best of all, it's where the food and drinks are. So in the house party of life, I'm in the kitchen. And that's really what my drunk kitchen's all about. It's, it's not about being drunk or getting drunk and like it's not about that it's about letting go and feeling safe you know it's it's about partying in a safe space ultimately like you're safe in my kitchen i'll take good care of you 
So that's really what is the motivation behind that. Nice. That's why a cookbook. <laughs> Do you have a lot of house parties? Do you cook for people a lot? You know, we try. Ella's really busy too. And like, it's funny because um, in the holidays, when you're with somebody and you're going to get married, et cetera, you now have like two sets of family issues to deal with, you know? In addition, you know, it's like, whoa, three ultimately because you have your family, their family, and then your family, and then our family, the family you're building together. And so over the years, we've really tried to prioritize this family as the first family. This is what matters when going into the holidays. Both of us are the type of people that are like, okay, well, I gotta do this because so-and-so needs this. Both of us are the caretakers. Both of us are the people our family turn to, to be like, you gotta help me out, or you gotta figure this out, or you gotta do this. So the second we started prioritizing our household as the primary household, our holidays got even better. Uh, one year, a couple of years ago, we took Christmas off. I was so exhausted. I think it was after Buffering came out, I was like, I just, I need to be like alone. So we just went off to the woods and it was just the two of us. And that's something I would have thought unimaginable to do when I was younger. I was like not figure out some obligatory event, just enjoy the holidays, get some rest, <laughs> rest, you know? Um, but we did it, we, we did it and everyone lived. There was some huffing and puffing, but everybody lived. And then the next year we hosted Thanksgiving. And we had the energy to host Thanksgiving because we took a break. In this book, there are only four recipes I would encourage you to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Those recipes are in the month of November. My favorite month because of my birthday, <laughs> Scorpio. Uh, <laughs> uh, November 2nd, just FYI. Yes. <laughs> you know, I want to tell Google to get me something. Uh, <laughs> so in November, uh, what I chose to do with this part of the book is put the four Thanksgiving staples, like the four dishes we make and how we make them. So if you're celebrating alone or if you're celebrating with a family or if you're celebrating with your friends, this is kind of a way of celebrating with us too. So uh, one of them is a recipe for garlic ass mashed potatoes. And I won't show you the rest because you have to buy the book. Uh, <laughs> but that recipe comes from me because uh, I really love some roasted garlic, buttery mashed potatoes, you know? I like mashed potatoes almost like they're like, like, a, like a seasoning, you know, like to add them to every bite, you know? And they're also good enough to just eat exclusively, but these mashed potatoes are kind of designed for incorporation because that's how I eat my Thanksgiving meal. If it doesn't all mix together, well, not like that, that'd be disgusting, but each bite intentionally mixed together, that would be good, uh, et cetera. I know people were like, what are you gonna do, make like a Thanksgiving smoothie? I was like, absolutely not, that's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> No, that, that, that's nice. Um, so, <laughs> no, I, I mean, in that aspect, I, like, like I mentioned, I, I feel like I relate a lot. Like I'm, I'm bicultural. I, you know, my mom is from Nicaragua. My dad is American, mm. and and we've had to really decide on traditions and like what is gonna, you know, what what's gonna carry on. And now I'm, I just got married. Oh, um, congratulations! Thank you. Um, and my husband is half Japanese and half white. And so now we're, we're trying to decide, like, what are we going to celebrate? How are we going to celebrate? Yeah. Like, you know, like in, in his house, they always have, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, but they always have to have white rice. Mm. And I was like, you really want white rice and potatoes? But, you know, you can't argue that, you know? And so <laughs> we're, like, creating, <laughs> we're creating our own traditions. And yeah. I think that it was really interesting. Well, you're creating the culture that your kids are going to inherit. Exactly. And I think one of the moments that we're in as a nation and one of the moments we're in as our generation is being intentional about that culture we want the generations after us to inherit that's kind of the meta of where we're at yeah. and it come and it comes out in those moments like this of like you know what yeah we'll do rice and mashed potatoes <laughs> you know because that means something to you and you mean something to me and that's the lesson we want to teach our children you know when did you what was the first youtube video you ever saw Probably Charlie bit my finger. Oh, is that? <laughs> See, that's, okay, that's the perfect example because that's the generation of you, that's the era of YouTube that I entered. It wasn't like, oh, we have shows. There was yeah. like just the very beginning of like Jenna Marbles and like the Fine Brothers and this kind of weekly programming. But when I thought of YouTube in 2011, I thought of Charlie bit my finger. Yeah. And that's why when I uploaded a video and sent it to somebody, it's not absurd that I thought no one would see it. 
because I was like, here you go, Hannah, I'm sending it to you via YouTube because putting it on Vimeo would have been ridiculous, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, Charlie bit my finger. I think mine was probably this dancing cat. I'm cat, I'm a kitty cat. I think, the, you know what the beginning of YouTube was? It was memes. It was, or a lot of it was memes. And yeah. what we call today like meme culture mm -hmm. was what the early onset YouTube was. And now it's great. <laughs> so you're a cat lover. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I mean, I am a cat in my, okay. in my okay. mind. <laughs> I will, I'll show you, there's a mental health day in the book I celebrate by talking about our cats and by the time uh, Charles, my beloved baby boy, almost died within the first 10 days of us getting him. This is me kissing him. Aww. This is Charles Xavier. <laughs> Charles Xavier Hart, he's very special. Someday I'm gonna write a children's book about him. He's got short legs, but he can do everything that Lady, our other cat, can. <laughs> you know? Um, spoiler alert, see you four years from now. Uh, so, yes, I love cats. What was your question? <laughs> no, do you have a cat? Me. No, I do have a cat. Uh, do you have two cats? No, I have one. One cat, two cats are easier than one. Is it? Oh, yeah, true, yeah. Two cats are easier than one. One cat is like, what are you, what are you gonna give me? I'm bored, I'm gonna yeah. destroy all your toilet paper. Two cats, they have each other. So even when you're not home for a long period of time, they're like getting each other's yayas out, you know? That's good advice. Get your cats. Get you another, if there's anything you take away, besides your copy of My Drunk Kitchen Holidays five days early, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be get two cats. I love food, and a lot of people that live in New York also love food. Mm. What's your favorite restaurant in New York? In the city of New York? Yeah. I have many, many, many favorites by category. Okay. I will say, that one that I, that I can't get an equivalent to in LA, or at least haven't found, is Keste, the pizza. Now they deliver it. It's not as good delivered. You gotta go to Keste, it's a tiny restaurant. It's, you gotta go, and you gotta get the pizza there. The, my favorite is the Pizza Del Papa. It's got like a butternut squash, cream sauce. I, it sounds crazy. And a smoked buffalo mozzarella, smoked Oh, it's amazing. That sounds really good. Oh, it's so umami. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and then, yeah, if you get delivery, it's fine. And then also get the burrata. Also, I think that a blending of both our needs is that I will repeat the question so that viewers online can hear it. So you guys can stay in your seats, and I'll repeat the question. That way, nobody has to stand up. <laughs> Except for Alan. Go for it. Oh, hi. Um, thank you for coming. My first YouTube video was uh, peanut butter jelly time. <laughs> peanut, peanut, peanut. That one? No. That's yeah. peanut, peanut butter. Jelly. Peanut butter jelly. Peanut butter jelly. Peanut butter jelly with a baseball bat. You know that one? <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway, um, sweet or savory? Definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, savory. 100%. I don't, I think of sugar as a seasoning, not as like a factor. It's like people treat sugar like they treat like, things that are doing other things, like butter or milk, like those are adding to the texture of, like elementally you need these things to actually complete what you're working on, right? Um, sugar is great, but I think we could use like literally half the amount and we would still get a sweet thing. So for me, I'm definitely savory, but mostly because I just don't like the way a lot of sweet dishes are prepared. Talking about preparing sweet dishes, do you wanna decorate some I'll decorate the cupcakes. Yeah, I'll decorate the cupcakes. Okay. Um, <laughs> the uh, other thing is that in the book for the Valentine's Day, we do the sweet and savory cupcakes, like I said. Um, and all I'll say is blue cheese frosting. Okay? I know. You're like, what? How's that even going to work? It does, but there's a reason why. You gotta get the book to find out. <laughs> okay, so I'm right. gonna go ahead and start decorating these beautiful little cupcakes. Uh, fear not, there are many, many. Stephanie, thank you so much for your service. <laughs> uh, there are many cupcakes that I did not touch or decorate. Um, I encourage you to use those. Uh, and yeah, they're right here. Let's get started, I'm gonna do it. So. Yeah, we can we can actually take your question. Well, she'll she'll decorate while while answering the question. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Oh yeah. You're good. Ask away. I can multitask. 
So if you have to write a book in the next 15 years, which you are, so I'll read that too, um, which YouTube star, if you had to write it with someone, which YouTube star would you write it with? John Green. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> um, which YouTube star would I write a book with? That's a great question. Uh, but And I'll answer it as I make a little ghost cupcake. So we've got a nice little chocolate bottom and a sweet little buttercream top. So. Um, yeah, I think probably, I think probably somebody that would write in a way, like I've never done anything fiction, you know? So I would love to learn from that. But writing is such a personal process, I don't even know how I would write a collaborative book. You know what I mean? Um, I know Grace and Mamrie are my best friends, and today I'm posting a video with them called My Drunk Pumpkin 2K19. And uh, do you push this down? The back. Oh, check it out, guys. We're learning together. Stephanie, you want to hold this up so that everyone can see? <laughs> yeah, now you're involved. Here we go. Uh, called My Drug Pumpkin. It's a tradition we started years ago back when we were in our 20s. OK, let's do it. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So this one, actually, I'm going to decorate like a haagen <laughs> Cool. I think I need a bigger tip. Ooh. Ta-da, number one. <laughs> I'm not an expert, I'm an enthusiast. That one's for you, babe. Thank you. <laughs> do you want one because you asked a question? You want, yeah. How do you want it? Do you want it, do you want it a vanilla style or you want to? Just, just have fun with it. Have fun with it? OK, this is fun. <laughs> OK, I'll give you a vanilla moment because we haven't done that one yet. And then do we have the other? We don't have the other tips. We use one with icing already and decorate the top? Yes. yes. You know what? I'll give you one of these. Can we do whiskey? Yeah, right? <laughs> um, I'm going to, oh, no, I have, now your statement inspired me. So I'm going to do, sorry, guys, this is what it's like when I film my drunk kitchen. That's why I can edit it down to five or six minutes. <laughs> I spend like 45. Oh, we have another question. Hi. Oh, ask a question, get a cupcake. Hey. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't have a question. I just want a cupcake. OK. No. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, people are always surprised that I, that I like my drunk kitchen, because I, I come from a background where I've really sort of seen the, the dark side of alcoholism and some real destruction. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to just, for the most part, just say thank you to you for having something that you know takes a thing that can and has been really, really dangerous and makes it just lighthearted and fun and innocent and not, you know, and, and really just something good out of everything else. And for the most part, I just wanted to say thanks for that. I really appreciate that, because I, I come from a similar background. And I think it's actually, you know, my favorite quote by Mary Oliver is, someone I once loved gave me a box full of darkness. Uh, I found out, I learned years later that this too was a gift. And I actually think it's my own family relationship and personal understanding of how dark alcoholism is and what it does to people we love um, that allows me to do this. Because I can keep myself safe and healthy, you know? I think that if I was in jeopardy of that, I wouldn't be standing here eight years later with a fully sustained career, you know? And that's kind of the thing I want. That's what I mean when it's supposed to be a safe space. You know, I go up and show up for interviews. People are like, you want to do shots? And I'm like, it's 11 AM, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, and thankfully, I'm like, you know, direct enough that I'm like, no. And I had no, like, oh my god, well, are they going to feel weird about me saying no? It's just not my nature. I'm like, no, thank you. That's gross. What a weird way to start the day. <laughs> uh, and much, if you have a question. Very yeah. much appreciate it. Uh, the question is pretty tangential, and I'm not even sure if you can answer it. But is there any possibility of seeing you show up in the new season of Being Puppy Cat? Oh, I wish. You know, I helped crowdfund that thing. I have so much Being Puppy Cat swag. It's so good. It's so good. I, I know Fred uh, personally, and I know Fred Arader, and I'm a huge fan of Cartoon Hangover. Um, I was in one episode where I played the voice of, like, a bot. Tempot, yeah. Yeah, Tempot, exactly. Um, so why don't you go ahead and leave that in the comments of their videos <laughs> and tell them to have me back, you know? <laughs> Will do. OK, great. Uh, I made your cupcake, and now I'm going to make you a cupcake. Here's your cupcake. It's shocked. <laughs> really good. And you're, now your cupcake's going to be a kitty cat. Spoilers. Get a, ask a question, get a cupcake. Huh? OK. Oh, yeah. Perfect. And I'll walk you through my kitty cat. Weird. Speaking of cats, why Charles Xavier? Well, obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> so our cats, uh, despite my love of cats, very sadly, I am actually allergic to a lot of cats. Um, it's never stopped me before, and it never will. So we got hairless cats. Uh, we originally went to go get hairless cats because I was like, oh, this cat doesn't make me want to die in my head, <laughs> you know? Um, anyway, so Charles is a little bit of like a mutt because he's not a hairless cat. 
He's got, he's half calico, half sphinx. So he's got a naked little belly, but his fur is like a bunny. It's like super downy. It's not, it's not the dander that you find in the cat hair. So um, that's why we got specifically that style of cat. The reason why we named him Charles Xavier is twofold. One, at the time I was like, is he gonna be naked? Bald as a bald as a bat? Let's just do Charles Xavier after you know Professor X. Two, Logan came out that same year. And <laughs> if you're familiar with the movie Marvel Universe and Logan, it's a very heavy, sad, awesome, epic movie. Ella went into it thinking it was like X-Men. You know, she's like, ooh, new X-Men movie, rated R, okay. She went in, and it was like, -na -na -na, and she was like, oh my god. She saw it by herself. <laughs> and she got out of the theater, she called me, I think I was on the road, and she was like, I just saw Logan. I was like, whoa, yeah? Who'd you go with? And she was like, I went by myself. And I was like, well, fun choice. Uh, <laughs> but it, anyway, so long story short, that's why. Because I love Patrick Stewart a lot. Like, I think he's my real dad. Um, <laughs> I love Jean-Luc Picard. Uh, I have never met him, but it's forever a dream. And Charles Xavier, because that's his name, you know? Yeah. Powerful Good question. Meeting. You're also going to get a kitty cat cupcake if I can figure out how to do it. Something's happened. <laughs> no, no. I'll, oh, wait. Let's see if I can have it happen again on the other side. OK, it's going to be more of like a peppermint, a nod to peppermint, you know? and impossible to eat <laughs> or hold. We're just going to put this one aside and start over. Hello? Hello. Hello. So I've been a fan since your early videos, and I, I think I remember possibly the first time you actually came out in your videos. Um, I think I remember, too. Was it, I don't know if it was the video with Ron making cheesecake. Oh. Maybe not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, regardless. Uh, my question is, was that something that you kind of thought twice about? Was it something that? Um, you were just like, this is me, I'm just going to mention it and not care about it? Or what were kind of your thoughts around coming out on that public of a forum? Mm, great question. So I, so what's interesting is that I think that video, I'd have to check the timeline, but I think it happened either right before or right after. I guess it doesn't really matter, but yeah, I think the first time on my main channel, on my main channel that I said anything about being gay, it was because I was wearing boots. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yep, and I was like, <laughs> you know? Um, and at the time, at the time there was a lot, everybody was really like hot for making multiple channels, you know? What we call playlists today. Uh, but everyone's like, you gotta make a second channel, you know? You can do something, you know, just on one of their things of like, this is the key to the kingdom, two channels. Um, <laughs> So I, uh, I took my channel, My Hearto, and I thought, OK, maybe on My Hearto will be comedy. And maybe your Hearto will be an outlet for you know, um, touchy-feely stuff. And maybe I'll really start to like lean into comedy over here and lean into everything else over here. There's lots of very funny videos on both um, and heartfelt videos on both. I found that I couldn't really separate church and state, ultimately, in that way. Um, but at the time, it's exactly what I needed, because I needed to come out, because I never wanted to have to I, it wasn't even coming out. It was telling everybody I was gay, you know? And Anderson Cooper had just been outed, and there was all the hubbub of that in the media. And I was at the very, very beginning of everything, right? Um, so I thought to myself, I never want a moment like that. I never want a moment where people feel like I've been keeping a secret. So I'm just going to get ahead of it. Not because it's a secret, but because I don't want people to perceive it as a secret I kept, even though my content isn't. You know, and that's where I had some sympathy for Anderson Cooper. He's like, I'm a journalist. At what point would I say, hello, blah, 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 I'm reporting live from the war zone. I'm gay, everybody, by the way. You know, and I, I had, I felt compassion for him in that moment. And I thought, okay, well, then I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to come out. Um, and it's honestly one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Um, I am lucky enough to receive a lot of gratitude from other people for being a part of their journey. And for me, that's, I mean, the greatest feeling in the whole wide world, you know? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Kathy, did you go? <laughs> What's your question? OK, do this. <laughs> I've always considered Jean-Luc Picard my dad, too, so we're you know, Right? We're, we're uh, siblings. Yeah. Um, I'm actually curious. Uh, what are you most excited about in the new Picard series? Seeing it? <laughs> I have to tell you, I didn't get the role, but I auditioned for a recent start. Oh! I tell I don't know Linnea. This is why you don't. This is why I can't do complicated things. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how I did that. This is this is what I can do. <laughs> this is my speed. 
I'll decorate, yeah. Well, it's hard because I think that this is a pretty, yeah, thank you, yeah, that'd be great. Oh yeah, if you put white stuff on top. Um, I auditioned once for a Star Trek thing and it was one of the most, like, I've never, ever worked, like gotten so excited about an audition and it was for Star Trek. I also auditioned for a Star Wars thing and I was like, cool, very cool. They're not really the same for me. Um, so uh, I didn't get the part, but um, to answer your question about the Picard series, I don't know. I'm really curious to see what they're going to do. I mean, frankly, I just really hope CBS All Access wants to do some online digital promotion, and then I can be like, I will fly myself to wherever Patrick Stewart is, <laughs> and I will meet him. I met Whoopi Goldberg. That was amazing. We played the newly friend game. Here's a cupcake that's happy to see you. Here we go. There. Thank you so much. Please enjoy. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. What about you? What are you most excited about for it? I think the, the new characters and like being able to, to connect with them again. Like That's not something you usually get in a television series. Like, go back and see them again. I just hope they do a good job. The other thing is that I think this is the first time that we're really returning to the timeline in real time. Because yeah. Discovery is also, you know, this is like, oh, my God, this is where TNG left off. How, or Deep Space Nine or Voyager, whatever the most recent one was. No, Voyager, they traveled to different, like, quantum, so, like, whatever, different quadrants. Um, anyway, so that's some Star Trek stuff. But I think that this is the most, yes, this is the timeline. And I'm looking at Linnea, she's a huge Star Trek fan. Deanna Troy, Riker's in it. I, Deanna Troy and Riker are in it? Oh, yeah, the new promo has it. I don't like to look, because I don't like to get my hopes up, because I fear disappointment. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> All right, I'm going to make yours, like, a little, like, uh, calm for Star Trek. DT. Yes, sir. Um, kind of similar, like going off of that, who is like the person you've been most excited to get to work with that you thought you'd never be able to or, or work with or meet? <laughs> Great question. So as you may know, recently I was on Taylor Swift's music video for You Need to Calm Down. That was nuts. It was nothing compared to meeting President Barack Obama. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, like, you know what, I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna do this. Happy Halloween! Yeah, here's your cupcake, please enjoy. Please enjoy your handmade Thank cupcake. You. And trust me, everybody, they're all delicious. Meeting the President Obama, I mean, you know, uh, it was not only incredible because I was in his physical presence, it was incredible because we actually had a round table and we had a discussion and a conversation. And yes, there was some like cameras, but there were no microphones. And it felt, I mean, it was so amazing to meet someone who's such a hero and such an incredible part of our nation's history, to meet him and to have him be exactly who I thought he'd be. Present, listening, and like, I was like, sure, uh, President Obama. They asked, he turned to me, he was like, now Hannah, what do you think the ACA needs to do to reach millennial audience? <laughs> that was how he like opened the meeting. He asked me by name a question to start the meeting. And everyone was seated in a very specific order. I was seated directly across from him. And I remember when we got in, the room was empty and we all sat down and I'm like saying, I said, Tyler, and I'm like, okay, we have name placards, da 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 da. In my little like ADAD, ADHD, hyper observant brain, I'm like, do 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 do, weird. The table, right, the chair right across from me has no name tag. Hmm. And that weird, that chair right across from me is about three inches higher. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and literally, moments before he walked in the room, I grabbed Tyler's hand and I look at him and I'm like, I think the president is coming. And he was like, right? Like, sure, sure. Earlier that day, we had just taken mustard off Tyler's shirt, so we were very excited. <laughs> and then he walked in the room and it was just so incredible. You know, and at the end of his administration, I think I've been to the White House three times total. Um, and it was just, we were really, it was a great administration in a lot of ways. So I was very happy. That was the most amazing moment of meeting people, you know? And Taylor Swift, probably after that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I'll keep going. This method I can do. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Also, if you just want to shout them out, I really will repeat them. Hi. Hi. I have a quick question about before you took off on YouTube, what did you sort of think that you wanted to do? Um, aside, I mean, maybe writing books. Um, what other... My career like, path, though. Yes. Because that wasn't a career path. Did you have a job when you recorded that video? Yeah. What were you doing? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, great question. Because uh, you asked about work, I'll give you a little green for money. <laughs> Ooh. Why is it like this? <laughs> it's so wet. <laughs> yeah, maybe it makes it. You know? <laughs> Hello? They're all like that. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> Put a finger in it, it'll look perfect. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, wait, you got little. These guys? Yeah. Oh, 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 these are so cute. I hope these find a good home. I'll take them with me. <laughs> Look. I think I'm one question behind, though. You get this against bullying. You'll be like, peace out, man. Here you go. You know, I'm going to give you a napkin. <laughs> Sorry, everybody else. <laughs> Here you go. Please enjoy. You. And you don't have to eat it, and you can throw it away if you want. <laughs> um, I was a proofreader at a translation firm. So I, uh, you know, I wasn't a theater kid. I didn't take any like improv or acting classes. Um, I was class clown, you know, um, but I never thought of a, I never pursued a career in entertainment for two reasons. One, scary, uh, to put yourself out there. And two, um, impractical. It's a gamble, you know, that even writing or publishing is a, heartfelt gamble, and the odds aren't in your favor that you're going to get your work out there. So uh, I wanted to go into translation. I figured, you know, if I love storytelling and language uh, and I speak Japanese, might as well, might as well do that. So I studied English Lit and Japanese language at Cal or UC Berkeley. Um, go, Bears. go Bears! Yeah! <laughs> we have to do that. <laughs> they got, I didn't even go to a football game and they, they got it in my head. <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, I was a yeah proofreader at a translation firm. So the whole first year I was on the internet, I was really, really, really worried that this was going to forever be a part of my resume. That every job I applied to, you know, Hannah Hart at 24, you Google my name, check me out, it's going to show up my drunk kitchen and some of these sloppy, embarrassing videos. And it was literally the feedback online that kept me doing it. It was probably one of the braver choices I would have made because in my mind, like you don't want to jeopardize having an income and having stability. But fortunately, because the market had crashed in 2008, 2009, when we graduated, there was no stability. There was, I wasn't getting health insurance either way, right? So why not go after a dream? And that environment made it easy to pursue. I posted a video maybe once every month at that in the whole year of 2011, I made the entire year while working part time and posting videos, I made $18,000 that year. That was my tax. Uh, and it, in terms of what came from online, it was t-shirts, you know? So really diversifying income and having work experience helped me build a business. And I think that the content creators of today, I, I, my heart aches for them because I don't think that they had that life experience before they got to that point. You know what I mean? The end. <laughs> <laughs> this one has sprinkles. You know, the buttercream frosting is amazing. So either way, you're in for a treat. <laughs> this one's a pumpkin-inspired cupcake. Look at that. Oh, wait. Let's do it like this. Hee <laughs> hee. OK, here you go. Please enjoy this cute little cupcake. You know what? I'll make two. <laughs> <laughs> one's going to be a little bigger than the other, but it's totally natural. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I like the slow roll of laughter as people get it. <laughs> there you go. Yay. Any other questions, guys? We've got 10 minutes. Or, you know, not. <laughs> do you listen to any podcasts? Oh, I do. I do listen to podcasts. So um, it didn't really work out because I sprinkled one of them. But you get it. <laughs> Here's cupcakes. Who wants one? I made two. You can take one. Do you want one? You can take one. There we go. And then this one's for her. Yeah. And then here's your napkins. You know, get yours. <laughs> uh, here you go. Um, do I listen to any podcasts? Yeah. Uh, I love my dad wrote a porno. Uh, it is X rated with a capital X. Don't listen to it in a car with mixed company. Listen to it 100% um, by yourself. Uh, but it is, it's a, it's a podcast about this guy whose father wrote like a, a piece of erotic literature and uh, sent it to him. And so he reads it out loud with his friends. And it is, 
It is so hilarious, not only because of the dynamic of, ew, dad, like, I can't believe you wrote this, but mostly hilarious because of the writing. The writing style is so absurd. His use of like adverbs, it's like, what are you doing? Um, and so I find it really hilarious. It's called My Dad Wrote a Porno. It's filthy, but harmless. So I, I, I love that one. Um, I think, have you asked a question yet? I have not. You have not? No, I not. Oh, please. Yeah, he's just helping me out. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, maybe like three months ago, got a second cat, and I have to disagree. <gasps> I know, and I, <laughs> I was really, really hoping that it would make things better. It kind what of What are has, the ages of your cats? They're like a year and a half, and then like half a year. That's, so like, they're like a year apart. The lady and Charles are like six years apart. So developmentally, mm. I think I should have been more clear. A second <laughs> cat, not another kitten. <laughs> yeah, well my first cat is a lot better now. Um, and I appreciate her a lot more now that I have number two. Um, I'll take three cats. <laughs> What's up with number two? Um, well, for, for one, they like to cause trouble together now. Oh, so and they're they like having to, like, a good throw time. throw each other into things, and like more things are breaking. And there's like more of a mess to clean up. Um, so do you have any advice? I have so... Just cat advice. I have so much advice about cats. Um, so cats, okay, people pay all this like love and attention to dogs. And this is not a one or the other kind of vibe. There is no cat versus dog person. There, we just live in a very dog friendly, dog motivated culture, which is great. However, there are ways to have happy cats that don't mess up your shit, you know, period. So. Um, I'm fortunate enough to know Jackson Galaxy. He's uh, the cat daddy himself. We've worked together um, on different projects. And then also I've just watched every episode of My Cat From Hell. Um, so cats are kind of like, honestly, the best way to put it is to think of a goldfish. Would you ever have a goldfish live in a world that's like this? You'd never have them live in a box that might have a lot of room, but it's all one linear plane. Cats need vertical as much as they need horizontal. Like when a cat scratches, a vertical scratching post is different from a horizontal one. So having both keeps them off of your stuff. Because the only reason why cats go and mess with your stuff is because they're looking for stretching out their muscles in different ways. Um, we have shelving that we have for them. They just jump up there. Once they, I have a route for them that's completely off the ground and away from our stuff, and that they keep knocking things over, they're not knocking anything over. They're playing. They're jumping up and being like, oh, I'm on a countertop. But if you give them a shelf that's like here, mm -hmm. this is going to be boring. They're going to be like, dink, 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 and they can watch. So cats are just curious because they're intelligent, you know? And they, they need stimulation, windows, stuff like that. I have a lot of advice about cats. <laughs> I, I ask for advice about cats from literally everybody I know. And I've had cats for a really long time as well, so I'm just still like, Help. Help, yeah, no, yeah. I hope any of that works or like is helpful at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would just say, say that it's like stimulation. Right now though, you have two kittens. You don't have two cats, you have two kittens. So this is what you're in for, man. <laughs> They'll get older. That's true. It's true. With time. Yeah, with time, exactly. <laughs> What's your question? Ooh, I'll make you a cupcake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really good to see you here because your persona is very authentic as one I mentioned earlier. Um, but what challenges have you seen in this midst of the light culture that we're currently in and how does that affect how you create your videos and your persona, I suppose, online? You know, I don't, re you know, that's a great question in terms of the light culture. Um, I, I, it would destroy my soul to be in the pursuit of views and likes. It hurts because all the times that I've made a video that I don't love or that I'm like, this one didn't do it for me, but I guess to feed the system, I gotta keep regularly posting, which turns out it's not true. I started regularly posting, and my views kept going down and down and down, which is nuts. So now I have the freedom of just doing whatever I want because it hurt me as a creative to try and play a part of a system that was actually detrimental to myself in terms of inspiration killing, and then also literally, like instead of getting 50,000 views, it's like 20. And I was like, huh, it turns out regular content creation, not, not the trick after all. <laughs> um, that being said, I, I just can't live that way. I wouldn't be able to work in this industry, and I love this industry. I love entertainment. And I'm fortunate enough that I have a 99%, 98% like rating on all of my content. 
Like it's 98% for the last eight years, lifetime. Um, and I think it's because I only make stuff that I would want to watch. And I don't shit talk. I don't promote negativity. I don't promote like sugar, sugar, gumdrop positivity. It's just I am me. And so the people that find me on my little corner of the internet, they're happy to be there. And I'm happy to have them. So that's how I survive it. It's funny because I get interviewed all the time about like strategy and like content creation and how do you make this and how do you get this and how do you build this. And I'm like, I don't know, it's a game I don't want to play. So I definitely think you should ask somebody else. I think the answer is going to be money. <laughs> <laughs> so those are my thoughts, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, you guys, do we have any questions? Let's do one more. I would line up for the last year questions now. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know where you Too saw good. my junk kitchen in, say, 10 years. I don't know. That's a great question. The question is, where do I see my drunk kitchen in 10 years? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, for me, it's like, it's hard to answer that because I, I work in the present, you know? And I don't believe in making like a 10 year plan. I believe in having a 10 year goal. But that goal needs to be something that's as true to you as possible. So for me, it's like, okay, in 10 years, I want to feel safe. I want to feel like I've got a good structure underneath me, that I'm okay. Um, so what does that mean? Okay, well for me that means building a lot of residual income so I don't have to be constantly generating new projects because I don't get a regular paycheck. So like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how I view 10 year, five year, whatever plans is what is the thing I need at that point? Because everything else you can figure out as you go along when you're in the present. Sometimes when you make a five year plan or a 10 year plan, if the first step doesn't go well, you're like shattered. You know, you're like, oh no, that first step, it's supposed to lead to steps B, C, D, and E. You know, uh, what am I going to do now? Which is why I encourage the idea of the goal, because then there is no first step. There's just starting moving towards your goal, and you can redirect and pivot and just do whatever you're doing that continues the momentum towards your goal itself. So that's, that's my take on the 10-year plan. This is where I'm at right now. And it's been really wonderful because finding my voice I found my voice online, and now I'm able to share it in so many different ways. And that is a clip you guys can use, Google. Because <laughs> I'm holding the book the whole time. Please enjoy. Um, everybody, thank you so much. We have time for one last question, if anybody's got like a burning, burning question. Um, so please do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I knew. Yeah, let's go. One last question, and I got to make your cupcake. Hee 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 hee. Hopefully this will be the most frivolous question. Yeah. Um, no one agrees three. with me, but you've met him in person. Does Jackson Galaxy look like David Cross covered in tattoos? <laughs> Linnea agrees. <laughs> look at her, she's like, yeah, you know what? I think you're right. <laughs> he is exactly who he is. He's one of those hosts, those talents that you get what you get. That is Jackson Galaxy, man. And he loves, loves animals. He's bipetual, FYI. So he loves cats and dogs. Um, and <laughs> he taught me that phrase. Um, I, he actually comes on the podcast, Analyze This, uh, the self-help podcast that just can't help itself. And he speaks really profoundly to like the animal care world. So if you guys have any interest or have people in your life that either work in shelters or veterinary kind of fields, I would really encourage them to listen to that episode because it really pulls back the curtain on what care providers for animals that are in need actually need. So I found that really illuminating. Other than that, thank you guys so much for having me. And come grab a cupcake. Decorate it yourself. See how hard it is. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank and thank you, you Stephanie. Much. Thank you. Yay. Yay.